Well, you can see the after impact of last night's celebration. Uh, just uh, what a beautiful uh, night of joy it was. And, and indeed, this is, this is the truth of the matter is that uh, Mary brings the greatest news ever is that God has become man. And God wants to be close to us. God wants to unite himself to us and wants us to be united to him. And that was what the message of the tilma was. In 1531, of course, Juan Diego, simple Indian uh, who had just converted to Christianity a couple years prior, I was walking along to catechism class and he hears music. And he, he's drawn up the hill and he says, where am I in this beautiful place, right? Is this the land of flowers? Is this the land of the ancestors? Because they had this expectation. Heaven was a place of beautiful flowers and music, right? So he's like, he's entering into the courts of heaven. And then our lady appears to him and says, right? I want a chapel to be built here. Right? And he's like, I want you to go talk to the bishop. And he's like, I, the bishop's not going to believe me. I'm a simple, simple man. He's like, you go talk to him. He's like, okay. <laughs> so he goes. And of course, the bishop doesn't listen to him. So he comes back to our lady and says, I told you he wouldn't listen to me. And she says, you go back again. I don't make mistakes. <laughs> Tell him I want a chapel here. And so he goes back again. And the bishop, he says, okay, if our lady wants a chapel, ask her for a sign. And so he goes back. And... Um, on the way, his, his, his uncle is very sick and dying. And so he's trying to find uh, a doctor instead of going to talk to Our Lady. And Our Lady appears to him and says, where are you going, Juancito? <laughs> and he's like, uh, well, Lady, I wanted to come talk to you, but I, but I, I had to take care of it. He's like, why are you worried? Am I not here who am your mother? Don't worry, or I will take care of your uncle. He's being healed even right now. You go up the mountain, you get a sign for the bishop. So he went up the mountain and there were flowers, tons of Castilian roses, which were native to Spain. They were not native to Mexico. The bishop was from Spain. That was very important. So then he would see the sign. And so uh, he gathered up in his tilma, the roses, Our Lady arranged them with her own hands. And she said, you take the tilma to the bishop. Don't show anybody until you get there. She goes there, he opens the tilma in front of the bishop, the flowers fall to the ground, and on the tilma, on his worker's garment, is imprinted this miraculous image of Our Lady. And of course, the bishop then believed, and they uh, built a chapel there, and over the next 10 years, 8 million people became Catholic. It was the single greatest event of evangelization in the history of the church. And it was very important because at that same time was the Protestant Reformation that was happening in Europe, and so about 8 to 10 million people left the Catholic Church in Europe, and then eight to 10 million people became Catholic in the new world. And so we see where the faith was being uh, decimated, as you will. Our Lady was bringing about a new springtime of the faith in the new world. Now, why did it cause so many conversions? Of course, we see clearly that this, for the Christians, for the Spanish conquistadors, they saw this was the woman of Revelation 12. This is the Ark of the Covenant. This is Our Lady. This is the one who uh, is standing with clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, a crown of 12 stars, uh, and one who crushed the dragon. But for the Aztecs, it spoke the same message, but in language they can understand because they didn't have a biblical background. They had their own pagan background. And so we see in this image a codex that the Indians could read. And so we notice here in the image, we see that she is, uh, she's clothed in blue, which is for royalty, so she's a queen. They knew that, but she's clothed with the stars, so she's the queen of heaven. Wow, the queen of heaven has come to visit us. That's pretty remarkable, right? Uh, but is she a goddess? In fact, there were other goddesses that they, they worshiped many different gods. There was one god called Tonansen, and so the, the Franciscans thought, oh, they're just worshiping Tonansen under a, under a new name, but that's not true because she didn't wear a mask. All the Aztec gods had masks. You never saw their faces because they were gods. And so the fact that you could see her face showed that she was not a god, but a human woman. How is it that a human woman can be the queen of heaven? The mystery grows. So we then look and we see that over her womb, there are many flowers on her dress. And if you get up closer, you can see them. But there's one unique flower that's right over her womb. It's called the Queen Cook's Flower. It's got four petals and a central hub. And this was a symbol of divinity, the center of the universe. And so that's right over her womb. And we see that she's wearing a sash, which... Uh, is a symbol of, of being pregnant for the natives. And so they knew she was pregnant with a god. Ah, that's how she is the queen of heaven. This is the god of gods, the god of the heavens, right? Who's greater than the sun god whom they worshiped, greater than the moon god whom they worshiped. So she is in fact the mother of a god who is greater than all the other gods they worship. So that was intelligible to them. 
But we recognize all the gods that the Aztec worshipped were very cruel and vindictive and spiteful and required human sacrifice. And so they're wondering, is this god going to be the same as all the other gods that we worship? And so we see the lady is the messenger. She, of course, the gods, if you were a warlike, aggressive god, you're looking straight up and you're looking right at the eye. It's a po posture of aggression. She's looking downcast. So she, her eyes are, are turned down. She's a posture of humility and of peace. I've not come for war. I've come to bring peace. So her son that she carries also is a god of peace. Indeed, the Lord Jesus, the prince of peace. Right? So we see how this used native language. But we also see that the arrangement of the stars are important because the priests were the ones actually who oftentimes when Christianity comes to a pagan culture, the priests are often the worst enemies of the faith because they see it as taking away their power, right? So they usually fight a lot. But what happened was the priests were the first to convert because the priests studied the stars. So it's kind of like the Magi of the East, right? They studied the stars and they were waiting for a Messiah. They saw the signs in the heavens. These priests, when they looked at the stars on Our Lady's mantle, they recognized this was exactly the position of the constellations that were present on the day Our Lady appeared, December 12th, 1531. We've been able to confirm this using computer technology with Redshift uh, 7, I think is the program, where you can go back to any position of the stars in history. And it's really cool. It's kind of like you can wind back the clock. And so we've wound back the clock and found that this is exactly the position of the stars that were present when Our Lady appeared at 6.45 in the morning. Exactly, right? So what's really exciting is that's the time, around the time when, our, when Juan Diego appeared, uh, when Juan Diego gave the tilma to our bishop was in the morning. And so we see here, this is probably like a photo snapshot of exactly the time when Our Lady appeared, but not from the perspective of Earth, from the perspective of the sun. The priests could read that because they were experts in the stars. Like, this is odd. Like, oh, it's with the sun being right here over her womb. <laughs> ah, do you get it? <laughs> the priests got it. They realized, oh, okay, this is the Lord of the stars, the very sun himself. And so no problem. They immediately requested baptism when they saw this image. They wanted to be Christians. They saw, of course, the cross brooch. So they had heard of Christianity, right? The conquistadors had brought Christianity, but they weren't impressed because the conquistadors were not very virtuous people. When they saw this, they're like, ah, okay. So they, she hasn't come to destroy our gods. She's come to bring us all together to bring an age of peace, which is what they were hoping for. And, uh, and it's just remarkable. So, so th really, that's why they brought just groups, thousands at a time. One day, two Franciscans baptized 10,000 people, but they had, you know, I mean, it's remarkable. You had a steady flow of traffic of about five to 20,000 people every day for 10 years on foot, before radio <laughs> or television. The word of this just spread because there was a culture of death and human sacrifice and Our Lady was saying it's over. There's now gonna be peace and an era of justice will reign. And in fact, um, I'm calling you all to be part of the same family, both if you're Spanish or if you are a Mexican, native Mexican, because we see that she's a mestizo woman. So she's saying it's, it's okay to intermarry. It's okay to form alliances together because you are all children of the same mother. You all have the same father. Christ is your brother and he's your savior and he's your God. So you see how Our Lady proclaims the gospel in native language. It's so amazing. Tonight we're going to talk about some of the scientific miracles uh, that are being discovered even more about this image because uh, first of all we have no other material. It's made of cactus fiber by the way so that's how they made the tilmas. They wove cactus fiber together, agave material. Most agave material de decomposes at most in 50 years. We have no existing agave material from the 16th century. None. Okay. And this is going on 500 years strong. So it's just remarkable. In, in, in 2031, it'll be the 500th anniversary of Guadalupe. And as people have examined it, scientists have looked at it, they see no evidence of decay. And it's plant material. Right? And for the first hundred years, it was not behind glass. The first hundred years it was exposed to the humidity, to the smoke, to incense, and to literally millions of people touching it with their dirty, oily hands. <laughs> and, by the way, rubbing their teary faces on it. One Spanish painter who was making a copy noted that in two hours' time, while he's sitting in front of the image painting it, at least 500 people touched rosaries to it. In two hours, 
in one day. And imagine for a hundred years it was exposed. So there's no reason this thing wasn't shredded to bits within a few days. The fact of the matter is, friends, just the fact that it exists today is a miracle. And it's an ongoing miracle. There is a force of some divine power that is operating on the tilma to keep it around. Right now, it shouldn't exist. So this is the greatest ongoing miracle in the church other than the Shroud of Turin and the Eucharist. In fact, there are only two works in the world where science cannot explain how they are around. One is the Shroud of Turin and the other is this. It has been submitted to many scientific tests and they're like, this is impossible how this thing even exists, much less we can't make it. There are no brush strokes, there's no paint, there's no primer, there's nothing. It is simply imprinted on both the front and the back, every single thread is the color. It's not painted. So it's literally colored thread. They took it to a German chemist in the 1970s and they said, analyze this. Tell us what the paint is made of or what the pigment is. And he says, it's not in the periodic table of elements. It is simply colored and I don't know how. Isn't that amazing? You have one of two options. This thing is either made by aliens and it is being held in existence by aliens or God. Literally, that's it. Because we can't replicate it with 21st century technology, much less we've tried to make copies of it. Every single copy we've made on agave fiber, it doesn't even look like this. But even the ones we've tried to make in the best of conditions and hermetically sealed conditions, they completely fall apart in 50 years. So literally, friends, this is an ongoing miracle. And so when people say miracles don't happen, yes, they do. And it's in Mexico City and you can go see it. It's there. There's tons of other things, friends, about this. I just, we could talk for hours about it because it's, it's, it's so amazing. They did in the 1980s, a, a, a priest thought, what if I like rearrange, what if I put a map of Mexico on top of Our Lady. Just like weird thought, okay? So he put the map, a topological map of Mexico on top of Our Lady with a star, with, with Tepeyac being right over where the womb was. And there was a 70% arrangement of the other flowers with other volcanoes in Mexico. And others thought, I think he might've made a mistake. And so he put not Tepeyac over the, the, the womb, but Star Mountain, which was much more important for the Aztec priests. They would put, they would go up Star Mountain and like observe the stars. So he put Tepeyac Mountain over Star Mountain and then laid it out. And he found there was a 95% match with the other flowers being principal mountains and volcanoes of Mexico. So Our Lady became one with the land. Do you see why Mexicans love her so much? Our Lady is literally synonymous. She is the mother of that country. And by the way, they didn't have really good accurate maps at that time. So there's been secrets that have been hidden in this image that we've only discovered in the last 40 years because of modern technology. Do you see why I love her so much? She's so great. She's so great. Oh, by the way, and they also put ophthalmology scope on her eye and there are 13 images in her eyeball. Do you see how big those eyeballs are? Okay, so they are 11 millimeters in diameter. And by the way, there's no human hand that can paint that. You have, to, you have to blow it up like a thousand times to see these things and they're reflected in the eyeball in the way a regular eyeball would contain them. They're curved appropriately according to the dimensions of a human eye. I'm telling you friends, like it's just remarkable. You need to look this stuff up. If you haven't gotten the book, the Guadalupe Mysteries book, it's like a coffee table book. It's like literally the best. The Knights of Columbus have a great documentary on this. You can study it. But friends, golly, it's just, it's so incredible. When you have atheistic friends who are like, miracles don't happen, be like, they absolutely do. And this is case in point. So they have to come to grips with, there is something outside of the human race that is capable of making this. Whatever that is, is more powerful than you and me. So we better figure out what that is. And in fact, there is no theologian, no art historian, no 
person who has the capacity, the mental acuity to have made such a perfect catechesis on the faith that enculturated perfectly all the indigenous history and all their mythology and all of their theology and Christianity, put it together in one image. There literally is not a Thomas Aquinas who's brilliant enough to do that. So what do you have? God has been reaching out to every land, to every people, wanting everyone to embrace the Lord Jesus. Really, Our Lady is just a testimony. She's the Ark of the Covenant. She's so important and so impressive because of the treasure she contains. So let's come before the treasure today, as she did, and let's rejoice in our Lord. Our Lady of Guadalupe, pray for us.